We're going to begin today by stepping into a time machine and traveling back to the year 1884. In fact, we're going to specifically alight on a bright and sunny day in the fall of 1884 on the grounds of Old Woodward High School, um, which was located a few blocks to the southeast from the uh, university's setting on the old McNicken estate. Now, as you remember from our prior performances here, the McMicken estate was decidedly unsuitable for any sort of athletic activity. As you can see here, it's built on a rubbly hillside. The students compl complain regularly about their inability to play football, baseball, tennis, anything on the McMicken grounds. <coughs> so, it was at Old Woodward that the university gathered together to play its second game of baseball. Now, when we get out of our time machine in 1884, and we're on the grounds of Woodward High School watching the universities going out to play the Woodward team, there are some things that you're going to notice. In fact, there are some things that you are not going to notice. And what you are not going to notice is at this time there was no mascot, there was no logo, there was, were no school colors, there was no fight song, there was no alma mater, there was no band, there was no cheerleaders, there were no uniforms. In fact, at this particular time you would have seen nothing, even though our team beat the high school team 14 to 3 to indicate that you were watching anything other than a backyard pickup game. In 1884, the students were not even sure how to reference their university. Was it UC, or U of C, or UOC? Some even promoted CU. Now when you pick up a copy of today's news record, you're going to notice a tiny block of type that says 132 years in print. And this is what is called bunkum twaddle. Okay. Because even though for 132 years something has been printed by the students of this university, it has not been called the news record. The first uh, of the student newspapers, which you can see in a lovely exhibit in the lobby of Blagan Library this week, uh, was called the Bellatrosco. The Bellatrosco evolved into the Academica, replaced by the McMicken Review, the Burnett Woods Echo, the Bearcat, the Cincinnati Student, and the University, before it changed its name to the News Record. From almost the very first issue, the students clamored for the accoutrements of a normal college. They wanted social clubs, academic clubs, cultural clubs, sports teams. They wanted a real campus. They wanted a gymnasium, and they wanted a motto. Now, not many students today realize that the university, in fact, has a motto. Since 1880, the university's motto has been Alta Pettit, even though in the early days you sometimes see it as Pettit Alta. Both arrangements translate roughly the same as she seeks the heights. When the phrase appears on coats of arms, as it does, there are several families that have Alta Pettit as uh, part of their coats of arms. It's translated as aim at high things, or seek the highest, or he seeks high deeds. But you get the idea. In an 1881 editorial, the Academica publication called for school colors. As they said, the great 
majority of American colleges and universities have selected certain colors or combinations of colors, which for want of an adequate term, we may designate as colors. These colors are of great use in intercollegiate contests in distinguishing the members of different colleges. They also have the effect of creating in the student a feeling of loyalty to his alma mater. Each year finds it more difficult to select colors that are not preoccupied. We therefore commend this matter to our students in the hopes that they will at once take measures looking to the selection of colors for the University of Cincinnati. The first suggestion was for green. The second suggestion was for black sprinkled with a little white. And there was no immediate action, thank heavens, on this request. In April of 1885, the UC baseball team took to the field against Hughes, sporting white suits with blue trim. Later that year, new baseball uniforms appeared in blue and brown. Although the university took its time selecting official colors, each class took great pains to select a unique set of colors. The annual for 1885, for example, records the senior class adopting green and yellow, the juniors claimed maiden's blush, and the sophomores adopted violet. Keep in mind that the colors might have been worn as modest ribbons on a lapel, they signified a very bloody occasion known as Flag Rush. Once upon a time, and for nearly 50 years, Flag Rush was the most popular sport at the university. And here's how it worked. The freshmen, each year, posted a flag somewhere on campus and mounted guards to protect it. The sophomores attempted to steal the flag and burn it. Both classes endeavored to beat the living daylights out of each other, and they often did. The class of 1891 mourned its lost flag thus. We had a banner once, a lovely flag colored in orange and deepest black, a harmony of tone. There was a hope of floating in its face that we all know should have been justified. How we loved that beauteous flag. We left it there, the brightest bloom on its fair cheek, a smile brightening its lovely faith, face, and in one short hour, that pretty harmless flag was burned. Now, although the fighting was mostly limited to men, the cheering was not. That dirge was written by one of the ladies of the class of 1891. As painful as it seems today, by 1889, the students had almost adopted blue and brown as the official colors of the University of Cincinnati. Although flag rush remained popular, the students attempted a legitimate athletic competition each spring called Field Day. And in 1889, the events included tug of war, hop, step, and a jump, three straight jumps, throwing the baseball, the 100-yard dash, among others. Music was provided by the Cincinnati Orchestra with solos by Herman Belstedt, who was the cornetist of Hoyt's Opera House Orchestra. The McMicken Review encouraged students, wear your colors. Remember, the university has blue and brown, class of 89, purple and white, 90, blue and white, etc. When the baseball team took the field in February 1890, they were resplendent in white shirts bearing the letters UC and dark blue caps, knickerbockers, belts, and stockings. And managing the team was a senior named William Strunk. Now, if this name sounds familiar, it's probably due to a book that's often called Strunk and White, although its actual title is The Elements of Style. William Strunk graduated from UC, went on to earn a PhD at Cornell, 
where he had a long career, and among his students was E.B. White, the author of Charlotte's Web and a variety of other books. White updated and expanded Strunk's classroom handouts, and the resulting book has been mandatory in freshman comp classes ever since. Now, Strunk had served on the organizing committee for that 1889 field day, the event with the blue and brown university colors, and one of the committee members was a sophomore named J.B. Strauss. They both held editorial positions on the McMicken Review, and it was in those pages that a poem signed by J.B.S. appeared in 1891 called The College on the Hill McMicken. Among the lines of this poem were, Dear colors on the heart resplendent glow, Dear colors, red and white, you know, of a wondrous crowd well met in a tip-top place, you bet, on the college, on the hill, McMicken. J.B.S. was J.B. Strauss, Joseph Strauss, the man who built the Golden Gate Bridge and placed a brick from McMicken College in the Anchorage. But in September of 1891, Strauss appeared to be egging on a decision about university colors with his suggestion for red and white. Strauss made a formal request for those colors uh, to student government in December of 1891. The student government voted against it and assigned the issue to a committee including Estella May Riley, Addie Levy, William Gustav Langenheim, Frank Stevenson, and George Deal. This committee deliberated for five months before announcing in April of 1892 that the university colors would be red and, and black. Inspired by this decision, student government went marching on to other heights. Black and scarlet, they said, after considerable discussion, were adopted as the colors of the university. Standard colors will soon be in the possession of the committee. All students are requested to wear these colors on all occasions. It was also decided to adopt a university button, and some members of the colors committee were appointed to investigate designs and prices. And there should also be a university banner. And so a number of the young ladies were assigned to develop a university banner. And they wanted a university song. And a call, they said, would be issued to the students to compete in writing a song to be sung on all McMicken jollifications. So a button, a banner, and a song. But at least they did not adopt the idea of the class of 1891 to have a university walking stick. It was reported that the university button was primarily displayed by the freshman class, but the red and black colors were adopted heartily by the canoe club. They were the first to develop their own flag bearing a red star on a black background as they chanted, canoe ho, McMicken ha, canoe ever, ra ra ra. Now as early as 1887, some students had lob lobbied for a standard university yell, but official yells were largely confined to the class years rather than the university as a whole. Today, we might call these yells cheers, and they're in the form of some of the classic uh, cheerleading calls. Uh, you all want to join me in uh, Heigla, Heigla, Heigla again, Heigla, Heigla, ha, Cincinnati varsity, rah, rah, rah. Gets the blood going, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. By the next April, 1893, the baseball team took the field against the Cincinnati Reds. 
This was something they did every year for uh, quite a few years in the 90s. They were wearing red caps, a light shirt with U of C on the breast in red letters, black trousers, and red stockings. The suits looked fine, according to the McMicken Review, and they were universally admired by the crowd. We're playing the cream of society today, said the Reds' general manager, Frank Bancroft, whose team proceeded to pummel the universities 32 to 7. In 1994, or 1904, excuse me, there was very little fuss made when UC acquired two stone lines. That year, the city of Cincinnati notified the university directors that the Lions were UCs for the asking. The pair had graced the estate of Jacob Hoffner, a wealthy real estate developer who lived in Northside. Now, Hoffner's estate was noted for its elaborate gardens and statuary, and a number of visitors to Cincinnati, including Abraham Lincoln, on a visit in 1857, toured the grounds of the Hoffner estate. I'm not sure when Hoffner purchased these lines, but there's a possibility that they may have been admired by Abraham Lincoln himself. When Hoffner died, he bequeathed everything to his wife with a codicil <coughs> that after she died, the inside art and statuary was going to go to the Cincinnati Museum Association, which was creating the Cincinnati Art Museum. And the outside art, including the lines, was given to the city of Cincinnati for placement in either Washington Park or some other city location. So when Maria Hoffner died in 1901, and since UC was a municipal university, the campus was considered an appropriate venue for the Lions. Now, the originals of Mick and Mac can be found in Florence, Italy, at a location called the Logia del Lanzi, which was constructed in 1382. Jacob Hoffner traveled widely, and much of the sculpture that graced his property in Northside were copies that he had commissioned during his travels in Europe. Now, copying Mick and Mac is copying a copy because one of the lions dates from ancient Rome on display here in Florence. The other is, in fact, a mirror copy of it made in 1600 by a sculptor named Flaminio Vacca. As the decades passed, Mick and Mac became a strong part of the university's identity. Students from rival schools had painted them in their school colors on the eve of football and basketball games. The tails have been broken off and replaced so many times that the facilities department keeps a set of molds available for, uh, for instant repairs. It's also said that Mick and Mac will come to life and roar whenever a virgin walks by. Almost every college in the United States has some sort of urban legend along those lines, so I wouldn't take it personally. As for Jacob Hoffner, he's buried in the family plot at Spring Grove Cemetery. There's a steep hill leading up to his resting place, but on either side of the steps are some beautiful lions um, in repose. So the wake lions that you see, the sleeping ones at his grave. Back in 1877, the dean of faculty, who is equivalent to the president today, asked the board of directors to procure an official seal for the university. The request was referred to committee, and as things often do when they're referred to committee, no action was taken for 27 years. <laughs> this did not stop someone from creating a truly hideous seal 
that was used for several decades on the diplomas of the university. In 1904, Charles Dabney, as a brand new president, reported the use of this design, but said he could find no record that it was officially adopted. Dabney also noted the use of a circular seal of somewhat better design that was also unofficial, but it was used on university publications. There are two emblems in use, he said, one upon diplomas, the other upon the publications of the university. Neither one appears to be officially sanctioned. So it was Dabney who suggested the creation of an official seal that reflected the university's ties to the city of Cincinnati. The matter was again referred to a committee, but this time a true seal was adopted based on the city's insignia. The official seal was adopted in 1904 and it was copyrighted by the assistant city solicitor in 1918. The seal was changed in the 1950s to reflect the founding date of 1819. Now if you are a devotee of blazon, which is this peculiar language that heralds use when they describe coats of arms, you'll enjoy this technical description of the university seal. The weird words in here refer to colors, so heralds call red jewels, they call gold ore, and they call black sable. So the official description is jewels. In chief, a pair of even scales ore, surrounded by motto of Yungta Yuvant, in base saltir, a sword and caduceus, both or, in crest an acorn wreathed with oak leaves on torse jewels, and sable, both or, motto alta pedit on or scroll, jewels below shield, the above mounted on a pointed ellipse sable, surrounded by a belt sable bearing the lettering, the University of Cincinnati 1819. In the space between the shield and belt are oak leaves and acorns, both or. Now by sheer coincidence, the seal of the city of Cincinnati incorporated into UC's shield was adopted in 1819. Since the 1960s, there have been efforts to create a less formal logo for the university, and these efforts largely were born and died until the fall of 1978, when the university sponsored a competition among the faculty of what was then called DAA. Professor Joseph Batoni developed the dueling horseshoes, as they were known, and his design prevailed over seven other contestants and was officially used by the university for the next 23 years. For a time in the 1980s, the horseshoes even appeared on athletic uniforms, but they were eventually superseded by the CPAW logo in 1990. After quite a few years of research and planning, the university replaced the Batoni design with a new logo created in conjunction with a systemic branding um, uh, program, and it was unveiled on September 17, 2001. The CPAW got an upgrade in 2004. Both of these efforts were largely assisted by the design firm of LPK downtown. We call it alma mater, and that's the name given to UC's school song in a 1927 songbook, but the same tune was called a varsity song when it originally appeared at the University of Cincinnati commencement in 1906. The composer of the alma mater was Otto Jutner who was a medical doctor, and he, in addition to writing the alma mater, essentially founded the study of the history of medicine in Cincinnati. 
Jutner was born in Breslau, Germany in 1865. He received a fine preparatory education at St. Matthias Gymnasium in Breslau and at the Grand Ducal Lyceum of Karlsruhe. When he came to America in 1881, this classical education served him well because he could not speak English and his teachers at Xavier University were not fluent in Germany, so they communicated in Latin. By the time Jutner graduated from Xavier in 1885, yes, UC's alma mater is written by a graduate of Xavier University. He earned honors in English. He studied for a Master of Arts from Xavier that he received in 1887 while simultaneously enrolled at the Medical College of Ohio, later to become part of the University of Cincinnati, where he earned his MD in 1888. Now, Jutner pra practiced medicine in Cincinnati, but he mostly wanted to sing. He organized in 1901 a group of UC students into a musical organization that he called the Stygians. They met in a hall on Elm Street near Washington Park. And more than 60 years later, one of the Stygians remembered a long hall, tables and chairs in the center, flanked on both sides with cross-back support boards, groaning with salami, knockwurst, pickles, rye bread, freshly tapped wooden barrels, quarter eggs, singing songs of his own composition, German songs, fighting beer duels. I'm getting thirsty right now. A small book of lyrics, published only for members of the Stygians, grew into a 1907 songbook published by the UC Alumni Association, and it contained a varsity song. Now, perhaps Jutner felt guilty for ignoring his original alma mater, because in 1915, he presented Xavier on the 30th anniversary of his graduating class with the Xavier fight song, which he titled St. Xavier for I. Jutner was married to Estelle Regina Baudet, who graduated from UC in 1899. He continued the active practice of medicine, um, and was known among the medical community for a monumental book called Daniel Drake and His Followers. In his day, Jutner achieved uh, some fame for regular diatribes against the evils of coffee. He died of a cerebral hemorrhage in 1922 at the too young age of 57. But no less a critic than William Howard Taft himself, the proud son of UC, and later president and then chief justice opined that Jutner's A Varsity Song was the finest, most inspiring college song of any I have ever heard. UC has three fight songs, which are also found in this 1927 songbook. The official fight song, more or less, Cheer Cincinnati, has always been anonymous. Red and Black is by lyricist uh, Curtis Beresford and the composer Alan Waterman. And Give a Cheer is by Gene Francis Small. Now, Cheer Cincinnati is the best known today, and it's likely the song referred to by sports analysis Frank DeFord uh, when he opined on the radio, what a glorious songs used to be associated with sports. Take me out to the ball game, hail to the victor, Cheer, cheer for old Notre Dame and many more, but best of all, I loved the songs, get this, for VMI and the University of Cincinnati. Yes, I'm a real fight song connoisseur. The other two songs are less popular today, but each of them has its own backstory. The lyricist who penned the words to Red and Black, Curtis Beresford, class of 1917, made a lifelong career as a building contractor and eventually moved out to California where he 
got through retirement designing custom guitars. The composer, Alan Waterman, probably wrote the music to Red and Black during a very brief tenure on UC's physics faculty. Waterman was so young when he was a member of the faculty that the yearbook notes that he was mistaken once for a freshman. He had a very distinguished career at Yale after he left UC, and he became the very first director of the National Science Foundation in 1960. A crater on the moon is named in Waterman's honor, as is a National Science Foundation service member. Give a Cheer is a somewhat sadder story. Jean Francis Small was on track to graduate with the class of 1929 when that fight song appeared in the 1927 collection. She was a talented young lady who used to give concerts on the radio even as a student, but she never graduated. She died a victim of tuberculosis just a month before commencement. By 1927, UC had a real band to perform these fight songs, and it grew out of World War I. A student named Ralph Van Wye returned to his engineering studies at the University of Cincinnati in 1920 after uh, serving a tour of duty in the United States Army. The university had just introduced a requirement that all male students participate in ROTC. And Ralph, having just left the Army, decided that there was no good reason he had to take ROTC classes. The Commandant, however, saw that Ralph had been an Army bandsman and decided that he was just the man they needed to organize the ROTC band. Rather than being excused from ROTC, Ralph was appointed bandmaster to the first University of Cincinnati ROTC band. And according to legend, Ralph organized the first practice in one of the laboratories at the College of Engineering where only eight members showed up. Years later, Ralph would say that on that day, the only letter we could form was the letter I. And it was from this ROTC band that the University of Cincinnati Bearcat Marching Band claims its origins, which raises the question, if you're part of the University of Cincinnati community, you've certainly asked yourself at some time, what the heck is a Bearcat? You'll find the answer at a Halloween football game in the early days of World War I. And I'd like to thank for research assistance on uh, Bearcat history one of our graduates, Mark Fields, uh, engineering class of 1980. UC Bearcats were born on Halloween, as I said, October 31, 1914, and the occasion was a football game with the University of Kentucky. The four key ingredients that combined to create this mascot were an opposing team named the Wildcats, a star player named Bear, a creative cheerleader, and a talented cartoonist. Although it was no powerhouse, during the early years of the 20th century, UC had a pretty good team going in 1914. It had uh, winning seasons in six of the 10 years leading up to 1914. And in the season of 1914, UC had managed to, um, to blank out every opponent. No one scored against UC leading up to the game. So Kentucky was the first real competition UC was facing that year. At that time, UC had no nickname. Teams were variously known as Varsity, the Cincinnati 11, the Red and Black, or sometimes the Coach's Boys, like Dana's Boys or Little's Boys. And in general, mascots were not yet common at colleges and universities. There's this curious bulldog that shows up for several years in the yearbooks. It's 
got a sea sweater and it's got this miniature hat. And it almost looks like a mascot, but it was never officially adopted. In the 1911 yearbook, students consciously attempted to pick a mascot and uh, proposed the dachshund because it was German, it couldn't run away, and it had a backbone. But a new era was born when Kentucky came to town. The Wildcats were a formidable team, and UC struggled through the first half of a close contest. During the second half of the game, cheerleader Norman Lyon, known as Pat, was inspired by the on-field exploits of Leonard K. Teddy Bear, and he created a new chant. They may be Wildcats, but we have a bear cat. The crowd took up the cry, yelling, come on, bear cat. And in the end, Cincinnati prevailed, 14 to seven, and the victory was memorialized a few days later in a cartoon published by the student newspaper. The car cartoon was by John uh, Reese, known as Patty, and it depicted nine vignettes from the game. Front and center is the bedraggled Kentucky Wildcat being chased by a creature labeled Cincinnati Bearcats. Now Reese was certainly inspired by his editor because although Patty Reese was the cartoonist, his editor at the student newspaper was Norman Lyon, who was the cheerleader who started the Bearcat cheer. The Bearcat name stuck, but not immediately. When the students published the yearbook for 1915, they included a mock epic poem, the Kentucky State Wildcats versus the Cincinnati Bearcats, which ended at last, outplayed, outtricked, outrun, outpassed, outkicked, Bearcat had Wildcat licked 14 to seven. Teddy Bear graduated in 1916. The Bearcat nickname dropped out of use at least in print, for a few years. That's a beloved portrait of Teddy Bear on his way <laughs> Half a century would pass before anyone thought to record how the Bearcat name originated. In 1965, the Cincinnati Alumnus Magazine printed a short note about the origin of the Bearcat name based on a brief conversation between Leonard Bear and Norman Lyon, who were still alive at that time. The magazine managed to get the date, the score, and the location of the game wrong. Uh, but they otherwise captured the essence of the origin of the Bearcat Wildcat cheer. Over the next several months, other alumni wrote in the correct details and provided some confusing and conflicting stories. UC Athletic Director Charles Milam claimed that Jack Ryder, a reporter for the Cincinnati Inquirer, had invented the Bearcat nickname in 1912 while reporting on a game with Tennessee. And another football player, Leslie Bryant, reported that the name was originally used by the Cincinnati Post in 1913 when it portrayed the photograph of a Bearcat on the field. In 1978, Cincinnati Post columnist Dick Raw collected a few more anecdotes trying to get to the bottom of this. And according to Raw, a Cincinnati lawyer attributed the, the name to a Sunday school superintendent named Roger Bear. Raw cited another version in which Leonard Bear launched the name when he was photographed next to a Stutz Bearcat automobile in 1914. By 1980, the UC Athletics Department diplomatically endorsed three alternate versions. The cheer at the 1914 game, the Leonard Bear and Studs Bearcat photo, and Jack Ryder's 1912 uh, football story. Occasional news articles cited Leslie Bryant's claim. Of these versions, only the first, the October 1914 game, is true, correct, and documented. The others are entirely mythical. Myth number one, Jack Ryder, although he was a beloved sports reporter in Cincinnati, 
did not report on the Bearcats at all before 1919. Further, UC did not play Tennessee in 1912. UC did play Tennessee in 1904, but there's not a report of the game that mentions the Bearcats. In 1919, UC met the University of Tennessee in Knoxville, and Ryder, who usually reported on the Cincinnati Reds, covered the event. Ryder's dispatch on UC's losing game was the first time major media used the term Bearcats. The Bearcats repeatedly threatened to come from behind, Ryder wrote. The Bearcats have been very strong favorites, etc., etc. From that day, UC teams have generally been called Bearcats, but he did not originate the term. Myth number two, if Leonard Bear was ever photographed next to a Stutz Bearcat, on the field or off, that photo does not survive. There's this photo in the 1915 UC yearbook, which shows Leonard Bear sitting in an automobile. But the automobile is a touring car and not a Stutz Bearcat at all. And the caption says nothing about Bearcats. Myth number three, Leslie Bryan he has a somewhat more legitimate claim. There is indeed a photo of a UC football player published in 1913 in the Cincinnati Post under the headline, they call him Babe in the Classroom, but he's a bear cat on the grid. Interestingly enough, the player presented is Leslie Bryant himself. However, it's quite clear on reading the story that they're referring to him and not to the team. In 1913, the Cincinnati Inquirer referred to Leslie Bryant as Bearcat Bryant, but again, they're talking about him and not the team. So where did this word Bearcat come from? It first appeared in 1889 as a synonym for the giant panda. In this case, Bearcat is a simple translation of the Chinese word for panda, Zhong Mao, which means bear cat. There are two types of panda. The giant black and white panda is Da Zhong Mao, or big bear cat, and the smaller red panda is Zhao Zhong Mao, or little bear cat. In 1895, a naturalist by the name of H.M. Ridley reported that the binturong, a large civet from Malaysia, was also known as the bear cat. The word entered American slang as a descriptive term for aggressive individuals. One of the first to adopt this, and this is kind of a telling uh, example, was P.G. Wodehouse, who was a very popular writer among college students in the 19-teens. And then, of course, there was the Stutz Bearcat, which was kind of the reigning sports car of the World War I era, which had nothing, so far as we can determine, to do with the University of Cincinnati Bearcats. The Grumman F-8 Bearcat of World War II appeared long after the Bearcats had their name. Without a time machine, it would be very difficult to prove, but it appears unlikely that anyone in 1914, Cincinnati knew that binturongs were called bearcats. Several zoos and traveling circuses displayed binturongs, but they were almost invariably advertised as binturongs. References to bearcats, on the other hand, were pretty common. Gene Green had a big hit with a novelty dance number, Stop That Bearcat Sadie. And it's clear from Green's lyrics that Bearcat is not an appropriate term for polite company. Sadie of the song returns home from San Francisco with unsettling new habits. And uh, the singer says, I said, Sadie, dear, please quit your Frisco habits. Listen here, Sadie, Sadie, Sadie. Stop that Bearcat dance. Stop it quick, I say. You should have better sense. Far from innocent fun, 
the Bearcat dance had a very unsavory reputation. H.W. Lytle, in a 1912 book entitled From Dance Hall to White Slavery, cautioned against dance hall patrons who used the dip and the bear cat to accomplish, quote, their purpose of intimate association with the opposite sex. Other contemporary references suggest a more robust and clean-cut uh, definition. Dime novels of the time boasted cowboys, boxers, broncos, oil wells, even frontier towns nicknamed Bearcat. A fictional 1917 uh, detective, Gus the Bus, was known as the Bearcat Detective. The military picked up on this rough and ready connotation. A fighting ship, USS Burroughs, was known as the Bearcat in 1913. And the 805th Pioneer Infantry one of the famous Negro battalions of World War I was known as the Bearcat Regiment at the urging of its commanding officer, Chauncey B. Humphrey. In his first talk to his men, Colonel Humphrey told them he wanted them to be Bearcats. It was a name that stuck. Colonel Humphrey was known for punctuating his written orders with the phrase, Why not excellent? It's pretty clear that Colonel Humphrey may not have known the Cincinnati Bearcats, but he certainly captured their spirit. Thank you very much. Look forward to seeing you next year. Any questions?